The Bible's New Testament begins with the book of Matthew. Like the three books after it, known as the Gospels, it tells of the birth, life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. Written in the latter half of the first century, many scholars and historians believe it was written by Matthew, one of the disciples of Jesus. Matthew was a tax collector in the area of Capernaum for the occupying Roman authority. Bible teacher Michael Carr takes us on a journey to Israel, the land of the Bible, to explore the life, times, and words of Matthew, words that prove the identity of Jesus Christ as Messiah and what that means to those who choose to follow him. Imagine with me Jesus and the disciples making that long trip down from Galilee, down the Jordan Valley. And night after night, as they look up into the night sky, the moon is getting fuller and fuller and fuller. It's almost like uh, a clock, a time clock, because Jesus knows when that moon is completely full, it'll be Passover and the time for the arrest and all that follows will come. So they finally make their way to this, to this place, the Garden of Gethsemane. It was a big industrial farm, really more than a garden. But they're safe there and they can sleep in the shade of the trees. Jesus leaves eight of his disciples at the gate as lookouts and he takes the three, Peter, James and John, farther into the shadows with him. It's one of the most personal moments. He really confesses that he needs them. He needs their presence. And so Jesus goes to prayer and he falls down. He's begging the Father to take the cup away. He's looking God in the face and saying, I know what you want me to do, but I want out. If there's any way out, I want it. So for the first time, I think the Father's will and Jesus will are, are battling in the garden. Gethsemane is, is the battle before the final war. If there hadn't been a Gethsemane, there would have never been a Calvary. So he goes to prayer and in the midst of his suffering, he thinks of the disciples and he goes and checks on the three and they're asleep. And this happens three times. He confronts Peter and in the Gospel of Mark, we're told Peter didn't even know what to say. He was so embarrassed, he was so sleepy, so tired. Jesus finally goes back to prayer and he says, Father, your will be done. The victory was won when he spoke those words. And remember, those are words that he taught his disciples to pray way back in chapter six. He goes back one more time to find the disciples and he finds them again asleep. Jesus is all alone. The people he trusted and depended on the people he opened his heart to have let him down. No man was ever more alone than Jesus of Nazareth in this garden. Covenants in the Old Testament are often established in blood, and the new covenant is no different. Only the blood will be Jesus' blood. Like the Passover lamb, whose blood marked the doorposts of the houses of the Israelites, so the angel of death would pass over, now Jesus, the Lamb of God, will mark them with his blood so they will never see death. Judas appears with a detachment of soldiers. They're armed, they have clubs, they have swords, they have lanterns and torches. They're expecting to have to search through the garden and find Jesus, but they don't have to do that. Jesus comes right up to the crowd and Judas greets him the way he would normally greet him. He gives him a kiss.
But Jesus isn't going to play along with this. He confronts Judas. Why have you come? He says. But Judas doesn't provide an answer. The soldiers move in and John tells us they tie Jesus up, tie his hands behind him probably. At that point, one of the disciples, Matthew doesn't tell us who it is, but John, decades later, tells us it's Peter. Peter jumps into the midst, he grabs a little sword, and he cuts off the ear of the servant of the high priest, rendering him unable to serve the high priest anymore because you can't, can't work in the temple if you're maimed in, in some way. But Jesus stops Peter. He says, don't you understand that I have 12 legions of angels. He's just been speaking to one of the angels who was trying to comfort him in the garden. A legion is from four to 6,000 soldiers. Jesus says, I have 12 legions, a legion for each one of the disciples, 72,000 angels. That's enough to deal with this mob, I think. In fact, uh, that's enough to take Jerusalem back from the Romans. But Jesus hasn't come to fight the Romans. He hasn't come to kill the Romans. He's come to die for the Romans and for you and for me. Everyone flees, the disciples run away, and Jesus is left in the hands of the mob. They finally begin their mock trial. But from the beginning, it doesn't go well. It's, it's hard to harmonize lies and all the false witnesses can't seem to agree. Finally, somebody brings up a charge from two to three years earlier, all the way back to John, ch John chapter two, where Jesus said, if you tear down this temple, I'll raise it again in, in three days. This is a charge that followed Jesus and his followers. Stephen is basically stoned because he follows the one who spoke against the temple. They can finally get two of the false witnesses to agree on, on that. But by this point, Jesus sees it all as pointless and he, he gives them what they want. He says, someday they'll see him seated at the right hand of the power. Jesus doesn't use the word God. He avoids that word with the high priest. He refers to God as the power. That's all they needed. They tear their robes, they spit in his face, and they, they begin beating him. He was already bloody from the agony in the garden. It's difficult to know just how much Peter could see from where he was sitting in the courtyard with all the temple guards. Luke 22 tells us that at one point his eyes met Jesus, so they must have been able to see each other somehow. What happens is, first when Peter's coming into the courtyard, someone asks if he's one of Jesus' followers, so he's recognized right off. A few minutes later, someone else recognizes him as a follower of the Nazarene, another one of the names for Jesus. Then a whole hour later, someone recognizes his Galilean accent, and Matthew is the only one who makes uh, mention of the Galilean accent, and Peter's exposed. He calls curses down on himself and denies even knowing Jesus. And Jesus had predicted this, we know, before, and then it happens. The cock crows. It's an indication that the prophecy that Jesus made, that Peter would deny him three times, when he had, he had affirmed that he would never deny Jesus. But now, a few hours later, he's denied him three times. The cock crows, and Peter bursts into tears. Now, two people denied Jesus this night, Judas and Peter. And Judas tried to fix things. He tried to return the money on his own power. He tried to make things right. But Peter, with that spiritual intuition he has, realizes of all he's done, there's only one thing that he can do, and that is weep.
This is the Hinnom Valley, a valley where in Old Testament time, some Israelites actually sacrificed their children to the god Molech. So this is a dark place. This is a place that's associated with death. And this is the valley where Judas comes. According to the old orthodoxy, you can redeem yourself. You can make things right. And when Judas sees Jesus led away, he tries to return the money, but of course they won't take the money back. It's tainted. So he comes to this place and in despair, takes his own life. The sickness unto death is despair. Judas might have found forgiveness if he hadn't denied the only person he might have come to for forgiveness. We're underground, the ancient city of Jerusalem, in the area of the Antonia, the fortress that Herod the Great built and named after his patron, Mark Antony. If you come to Jerusalem and you want to actually walk where Jesus walked, most of the times you have to go very deep. Uh, sometimes as much as 70 feet deep. We're not that deep now, but we're, we're definitely underground. It's pouring outside. Maybe you can hear the rain. So this is a good place to be on a, a day like today to talk about one of the really dark characters in the story of the crucifixion of Jesus, and that's Pilate. But behind Pilate is an even darker character. I think he's the most important New Testament figure whose name you don't know because he's not mentioned in the Bible. But he's the power behind Pilate. His name is Lucius Sejanus and he got Pilate his governorship. Lucius Sejanus was the second most powerful man in Rome. Tiberius uh, is emperor, Sejanus is his right hand man. And as Tiberius withdraws more and more from his duties, Sejanus becomes more and more powerful. He finally tries to stage a takeover. It's exposed in 31 and Sejanus is executed. So shortly after that, Jesus is brought to Pilate and now imagine Pilate's position. His job is on slippery ground. His, his, uh, his advocate, his patron has just been executed. So all Pilate wants to do is make as, as few waves as possible. And that's what's behind uh, the trial of Jesus in, in Pilate's mind. He wants to be rid of Jesus. And so he offers them Barabbas, offers them an exchange. That doesn't work. His wife sends word She's been having dreams about Jesus, have nothing to do with him. That doesn't work. And finally, he does a very Jewish thing. He washes his hands before the crowd and says, I don't want to have anything to do with this. You know, you take care of this problem. But he orders that Jesus be flogged before he's sent to the cross, a very Roman thing. This is not a Jewish flogging. All the Jesus movies are wrong. This is not 39 stripes. It's a Roman flogging. And there's only one stipulation in, in Roman law in regards to flogging, and that is that a man will be flogged until the flesh hangs from his back. Jesus has been handed over to the Roman soldiers to be flogged. You always flogged a person before you crucified them. It, it hastened their death. And so from this point on in the Gospels, all of the torment uh, that Jesus experiences is uniquely Roman. Uh, the crown of thorns, that's, that's a vegetative crown. We, we think of crowns as golden and you know, having jewels on them. But in the Roman world, just think of the pictures of Julius Caesar you've seen. He has a laurel crown. It's a vegetative crown. The winner of the Isthmian Games in Corinth would be given a crown of withered celery. Sounds kind of silly, but that was the big prize. And so the thorny crown that the Roman soldiers place on Jesus' head is a uniquely Roman joke, a very sick joke. 
Jesus has, in essence, become their plaything. They're playing a game with him. We know of about 70 different board games from ancient Rome. They love to play board games. You see the, the boards scratched in the pavement uh, all over ancient Rome. And one game was called King. And you would take your piece and as it moved around the board, at one point it would be robed, at one point it would be given a scepter. And then finally, just like checkers, when you go all the way across the board, it would be crowned and you'd win the game. If you look at the mockery of the soldiers, it's as if they're moving Jesus around that board. They put a robe on him. They give him a scepter, which they will later beat him with. And then they finally put this crown on his head. He's covered in, in their spit and he's covered in his own blood by this point. He's utterly cut off. And here on the floor, are some of the outlines of some of these ancient board games. Creeds all say that Jesus descended into hell as part of the suffering on the cross. I thought this would be a good place to talk about that, the crucifixion, because here we are under the Antonia Fortress, a moat that was dug by Herod the Great and a vaulted ceiling that was constructed by Hadrian later on when he rebuilt the city. But this is as much like Dante's Inferno as I could possibly imagine. Now the Gospels are all very minimalistic when it comes to details about the crucifixion of Jesus. Mostly they say, and there they crucified him. Matthew gives us more detail than any of the Gospels, and he's very dramatic is Matthew when he tells us about the crucifixion. We have an earthquake. In fact, there are two earthquakes. There's another earthquake when Jesus is raised. We have the tearing of the curtain of the temple. We have dead people coming alive again and coming out of their tombs. We have soldiers fainting from fear. It's a very dramatic telling. And all the while, Jesus is there in the darkness, a darkness that can be felt, a darkness that covers the whole country. The priests and the Levites are standing before Jesus and they're shouting, He saved others, but He can't save Himself. They don't understand that Jesus saves others by not saving himself. It is a vast oversimplification to look at the Gospels and say that everyone in Jewish leadership is bad. It's just not true. It's more complicated than that. There were at least two men, probably more, who were followers of Jesus already. In fact, one of them goes, goes to Pilate and claims the body of Jesus. Goes boldly, says Mark, to Pilate and claims the body of Jesus. His name was Joseph and he's from the nearby village of Arimathea. He takes the body of Jesus and wraps it and puts it in his own tomb, which was a tomb like this. This is a tomb of a wealthy person, first century tomb. Uh, just outside of Jerusalem. Now in Judaism in Jesus' day we had two-stage burial. A body is taken, it's perfumed, wrapped in, uh, in linen and laid in a tomb for about a year. This allows for decomposition and the flesh uh, rots away. About a year later you come back, stage two of the burial, the bones are washed, they're put into a, a bone box, we call it an ossuary. 
Now Jesus doesn't need stage two of the burial. In fact, he barely needs stage one. But the tomb that was provided for Jesus was the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, a very uh, high placed member of the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court of the day. Outside witnessing the burial are the two Marys, Matthew tells us. And you don't understand Easter, you don't understand emotionally what they've gone through until you see that for these two women, it is simply over. Everything that they've left home for, everything that they've staked their lives on, it's all over. No one's waiting outside the tomb resurrection morning for Jesus to be raised. Jesus had told them again and again that he would be crucified and on the third day raised to life. But I don't think the disciples were listening. After they heard the word crucified, they stopped listening. And so none of them were expecting him to be raised on the third day. But apparently the Pharisees were listening. After Jesus is placed in the tomb, they begin to worry that someone, one of Jesus' followers, might fake the resurrection by stealing the body. So they order that a guard be posted and the tomb be sealed. And they do this for three days. So they make the tomb absolutely secure. I think it's interesting that their paranoia has given us our strongest evidence. By making sure that the resurrection wasn't faked, they've given us our best proof. In the Gospel of Matthew, in the morning of the resurrection, twice the women are reminded that Jesus is gonna meet them back here in Galilee. The angel outside the tomb tells them this, and then Jesus himself, when they encounter him outside the tomb, Jesus says, go tell my brothers that I'm gonna meet them in Galilee. In essence, Jesus is saying, go back home. I'm gonna meet you back home. He gathers uh, on, a, on an undisclosed mountain. We don't know where where it was, but I like to think it looked like this, overlooking the Sea of Galilee. And the Bible's very, very honest uh, on what I call the persistence of doubt. Uh, they gather around the risen Lord. Matthew says, but some doubted. I find that incredible. And in, uh, in John 21, when he meets them down on the shore of the lake, it says, and none of them dared ask, who are you? Because somehow there's this doubt. But the Bible is an honest book, and there are people that were still struggling with this. Jesus gives them, finally, his charge. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And here come the final words of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew. He says, and behold, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. That desire to be with us is what it is all about. It's, it's the thought that holds the whole Bible together, whether it's God searching for Adam and Eve in the garden after the fall, or whether it's the tabernacle that God uh, gives the, Is uh, the Israelites the design for so that he can dwell with them, the temple so that he can dwell with them, the law so that they can walk with him and be his people and he can be their God. Or whether it's the incarnation, Jesus' incarnation name is Emmanuel, God with us. Or whether it's the cross that finally makes possible that deepest desire that we can be with God, that God can dwell with us, dwell in us. Those are his final words in Matthew. I'm always, I'm always gonna be with you. You can't be alone. You could never be alone.